Mr. Prime Minister, <clears throat> honorable ministers, chancellors and deputy chancellors, the vice chancellor, members of council, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. May I first of all extend a very hearty welcome to all our guests on this occasion. It is an important occasion, a milestone really, in the development of Monash University. The occasion on which we are attending the opening of our biggest individual project, the building to house the faculties of arts, economics and politics, and later on, when expanded a little bit, the faculties of law and education. We're greatly honored today by the presence of Sir Robert Menzies and by the presence also <coughs> of the chancellors of the universities of Sydney, New South Wales and Adelaide and the deputy chancellor of the University of Melbourne. We regret that our Premier, Mr. Bolte, was not able to be with us today. He is, as you know, on a visit abroad, being sniped at in some other country for a change, I think. Before proceeding with the business that we have in front of us today, I would like to go back a little bit to the year 1956 when after discussing the problems facing the Australian universities during an overseas visit, the Prime Minister on the 19th of December of that year, 1956, invited Sir Keith Murray, Chairman of the University Grants Commission in the United Kingdom, to chair a special committee with a wide charter to investigate how best the universities might serve Australia at a time of great social and economic development. In particular, the committee was requested to advise on the role of universities in the Australian community, the extension and coordination of university facilities, technological ed education at university level, and most importantly, I think, the financial needs of universities and appropriate means of meeting these needs. Now, this committee sat over quite a long period of time, visited all our universities, collected a lot of data together from them, and finally issued its report in September of 1957, less than a year later. As a result of the recommendations of this Murray Committee, <coughs> as it became known, the Commonwealth Government agreed to assist very materially in the development and maintenance of all Australian <coughs> universities by contributing to the capital cost of their development on a pound-for-pound -pound basis with state governments, and by contributing equally generously to the recurrent costs required to operate and maintain them. In addition, the recommendations of the Murray Committee resulted in the Commonwealth Government establishing the Australian Universities Commission with Sir Leslie Martin as chairman to assess the real needs of the universities and to advise the Commonwealth Government as to the financial assistance necessary. All who are interested in universities know the tremendous effect that these developments have had in promoting to the full the advancement of university education and the adequate housing and the adequate equipment of university activities. Only those of us, who have, however, who have been intimately associated with the finances and the building programs of our universities in the post-war period up to the time 
of the Murray Committee and the acceptance of its recommendations, and who have also been associated with these matters since the establishment of the Australian Universities Commission and the Commonwealth's entry into the financing of universities in Australia. Only those of us who have seen the situation before and after realise to the full what a tremendous revolution has been achieved in the status, the equipment, the academic standard and the capacity of our universities. This outstanding development in university education in Australia, of course, is not solely due to the efforts of Sir Robert Menzies. Naturally, he has had the support and concurrence of his ministerial colleagues, and I believe the wholehearted support of all members of the Commonwealth Parliament, irrespective of party. Furthermore, all the state governments throughout Australia have seen fit to endorse the scheme and to accept responsibility for increased state contributions to university development and maintenance. And this has been a very heavy burden. This university in particular has received splendid support from both state and Commonwealth governments for which we are indeed grateful. I wouldn't like to infer, of course, that we didn't need this uh, support. We did, and we still do. But I think we must concede that the interest and the initiative and the drive which led to the appointment of the Murray Committee and to the subsequent events were undoubtedly Sir Robert's. The Murray Committee, in reporting additionally to the Victorian Government, recommended the broad pattern for the establishment of Monash University. A full university was recommended rather than a technological institution, as had been proposed previously. Of a total amount of about £12.5 million pounds recommended as emergency aid for the universities for the 1958-59-60 triennium. However, only £150,000 was suggested to prepare plans for Monash, and a start of teaching was envisaged in 1964. This program proved a little bit inadequate. We are now in our third teaching year we have at the moment some 1,600 students and our first students will graduate at the end of this year. We have already spent some eight and a half million pounds in buildings and equipment. The building that you're in now has cost to date approximately one and a quarter million pounds. It was designed by Eggleston, MacDonald and Seacombe architects, and it was built by Messrs. E.A. Watts, Propriety Limited, in little more than a year. We believe that both the designers and the builders are to be congratulated on a first-class job. Incidentally, I believe that Sir Keith Murray uh, who was to a large extent the instigator of a lot of these developments with the Prime Minister's encouragement, will be visiting Perth in November to attend the 50th anniversary of the University of Western Australia. And we all hope, sir, that uh, some arrangements can be made for Sir Keith to visit the other universities in this country, and Monash in particular, so that he might be given an opportunity to see some of the results of his handiwork. Some details of this building will be found on the printed programs that you all have, but in the ultimate university, this building will be expanded to approximately four times its present size. It's 12 storeys high, 
and it dominates not only the university campus, but the whole surrounding district. It's devoted to the teaching of humanities, and it is the most important building in the whole university design. The next section of the building to the east behind you will be built in 1964, we hope, at a further cost of a million pounds. A notable feature of this building, as far as universities are concerned, and we think they constitute the first usage, is the installation of escalators in a multi-storey building. Uh, these provided a very good solution of the problem of transporting a large number of students within a very few minutes from floor to floor or two or three floors at a time in the period in between successive lectures. And uh, one set of escalators replaced, if I remember rightly, something like 12 or 13 lifts to carry the same number of people in the same time. It's interesting to note also that when completed, when the next edition is on, this building will hold or house 420 members of staff and 5,000 students. What a change has taken place in the uh, last 30 years or so to think that this number of students will be accommodated within one building and to think that this is roughly twice the total number of students that attended Melbourne University when I was a student there. It has been the practice of the council of this university to name individual buildings after Australians who have distinguished themselves in careers as statesmen and scientists and explorers and so on. We're particularly proud, sir, that you have consented to the Council's wish that this great building should be named the Robert Menzies School of Humanities. We think that this is particularly apt since it is in the humanities that you yourself have achieved academic distinction and we know that you yourself are particularly interested in this side of university life. This is perhaps not the best of situations for an occasion such as this. I think that uh, the Prime Minister, perhaps as a politician, might be pardoned if he imagined himself attending a meeting of the National Socialist Party in a beer cellar or something of that nature. But this is only because we have as yet no great hall in which we can hold ceremonial functions of this sort. And although it turned out to be a reasonably good day, sir, we can't always rely on the weather in Melbourne at this time of year. I must apologise also for the fact that building activity going on around us with our library to the east, with our administrative building opposite it, on the Union Building, which is going up facing this one, and also on extensions to our medical school. This activity has not yet allowed the immediate surroundings of this building to be landscaped. <laughs> However, Sir Robert, in spite of the surroundings, we know that this building will ultimately emerge as a permanent memorial in your own home city and in the world of Australian universities, not so much to you, sir, as our respected Prime Minister, although we recognise this as a great distinction, not so much to you as a statesman who has given great service to the nation, 
This has been most fittingly recognized by Her Majesty. But to you, as a man of academic achievement, as a man of culture, and in particular, sir, as the man who has contributed by your personal interest and enthusiasm for university education, more, far more, we think, to the advancement of that ideal in Australia than any other individual. <coughs> This, uh, at any rate, uh, is the wish and intention of the Council. Now, before calling on you, sir, formally to open this building, I would like Professor Scott, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, to tell you all something of the purpose to which this building will be put and of the work that will go on within it. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Scott. Mr. Chancellor, the Right Honourable the Prime Minister, our other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We're meeting this afternoon in the basement of a large, handsome and still unfinished building. The circumstances are in some ways symbolic, though I hope not in all. When I mentioned to some of my classes a few weeks ago that the opening ceremony was to be held in the basement, uh, there was spontaneous laughter. I certainly do hope that this somewhat claustrophobic and oppressive atmosphere, an oppressive setting, restrictive setting, will not be taken to symbolise any narrowness of outlook on the part of those of us who have our home in the building. You all will have a will have observed the imposing dimensions of the building as you approached. I had thought of telling you something about the building itself, but that's been done already by the Chancellor, and you'll find many details in your program. You will, too, later on, have a chance to inspect the building as it now is, with one lift fully installed, and escalators as yet reaching only to the fourth floor. That, of course, was as far as the money would stretch for this year. As the Chancellor has told you, the escalators are there as the most speedy and economical way of providing for the incessant traffic of staff and students. This is already a large community, and uh, it will become much larger. I do hope, by the way, that the Escalators don't remind you too much of the department store. If I were to continue speaking in symbolic terms, I might link them with the incessant traffic of knowledge, but I shouldn't want to press that analogy until they reach beyond the fourth floor because my own department is on the seventh. <laughs> Not all departments have as yet found their permanent homes here, and there are some intruders. You may have noticed on the directory board as you came in the name hairdresser. As you're all well aware, universities in this state, in this country, and indeed throughout the world, are struggling all the time to meet an ever-increasing demand for places. It is a fact that no other part of the university feels the pressure quite as much as that part for which this building is provided. That is, the general area of what are sometimes called humane studies. As you of course know, this building is to be named the Robert Menzies School of Humanities. It already houses the departments of the Faculty of Arts and of the Faculty of Economics and Politics. I shall leave the Prime Minister to comment if he wishes on the propriety of including politics as one of the humane studies. <laughs> 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 
The Faculty of Arts is much the largest faculty in this university and has indeed been from the beginning. It looks after nearly half the total number of students here. <coughs> there is, of course, no particular merit whatever in size, and I take no pride in mere size. Quite obviously, if the university were structure was of a different <coughs> kind, there might be division of what is at present a single faculty of arts. The point I do want to make is, I think a significant one, that about two thirds of our present students are engaged in the study of the humanities. When I speak of the study of the humanities, I'm making the well understood distinction between what Sir Charles Snow has, I think, not very happily described as the two cultures, <coughs> the scientific and the humane. A large majority of our students, that is, are working in the field of the liberal arts or the social sciences. Already the percentage is rather higher than at most other comparable universities, and all the indications are that uh, all the indications are that here at least uh, the proportion of students engaged in humane studies is likely to rise. In a way this is encouraging, obviously, but it does have its disquieting aspects. For one thing, it upsets the kind of balance most of us would like to preserve in the university, even though we might think of ourselves as the heart and soul of the place. But above all, it does face those of us who teach on this side, in this area of the university, <coughs> with a tremendous task. We shall, of course, do our best to meet the demand but it is a demand which threatens to overwhelm us in terms just of sheer numbers. I've been talking about the building, about student numbers and so on. Perhaps I should finally and very briefly say something about what we try to do here as teachers in this School of Humanities. Anyone knows that the Faculty of Medicine trains doctors and the Faculty of Engineering produces engineers, though occasionally also vice-chancellors. <laughs> the Faculty of Arts has no such clear professional function. We say that we provide opportunities for a humane education in a variety of fields, but just what does this mean? It's not at all easy to sum up the many different things we do, and I don't uh, intend to make the attempt but perhaps I can suggest, just in a sentence or two, the nature of our central aim. Ideally, at least, our task is not merely to purvey information, though, of course, information is necessary. It's not even to train people in particular skills. Our real business, surely, is to encourage the formation of certain habits of mind Above all, the habit of active and disinterested inquiry. It's for this reason that we conduct a great deal of our teaching, as much as we can, really, in small tutorial groups where there's the opportunity for some give and take. What I've just said about the, the habit of active and disinterested inquiry is no doubt true of the university as a whole. But the Faculty of Arts, perhaps a little vaingloriously, feels that it has here a special sort of responsibility. This really is the way in which we serve the community at large and indeed justify our existence. <coughs> We're grateful to have this fine building in which to pursue our activities. For some six months we've now lived and worked in it in what I might describe as a state of unblessed occupancy. This is the occasion of our official opening, and <coughs> if I may so put it, of our official blessing. May I hope, Mr. Prime Minister, that in the years ahead, we in our turn may bring some honor to the name we carry.
Thank you, Professor Scott. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall call on the Right Honourable Prime Minister to declare this building officially open and address you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Robert Menzies. Mr. Chancellor, most potent, grave and reverend seniors sitting here behind me. And ladies and gentlemen, I propose with your concurrence to institute a new rule, and that is that I don't speak with my hat on. I can't. <laughs> I'm very grateful to uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts for having varied the usual form. I always have to remember when I open anything that apart from uh, uttering a number of words and if possible saying something, I have to open whatever it is. But he's given me an alternative today. I may uh, either open this school or I may pronounce the benediction over it. I now do both. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, your uh, account of how this uh, new movement in the university world occurred was um, still interesting to me, though I had to play a, a, a part in it. I don't mind telling you that um, your broad hints about the financial needs of the future and the slight side touches on the same theme by the Dean of the Faculty of Arts uh, may appear to you to have passed unnoticed by me because I preserved a, a straight face. But the reason for that was that looking back in the audience, I saw that my colleague, the treasurer, was present. <laughs> And so he knows now as much as I do. And if he doesn't know it, I think the chairman of the university's commission, who's also lurking in this audience, uh, he will no doubt have made a note of it. And so in due course, something dreadful will happen financially, which will be something very good for the universities of Australia. You have to do a great deal of good by stealth. Could I offer that piece of gratuitous advice to those who are now training for some occupation in life? Do it by stealth. I remember when I had this idea of establishing a committee and if possible of getting Keith Murray to come and uh, preside over it. I didn't care to mention this to the treasurer of the time, who wasn't Mr. Holt at that time, uh, until it was practically completed. I, when I was in England and I spoke to Sir Keith Murray and he said, well, uh, I'd be very happy. This is the kind of thing that I've uh, had some experience of and that I would like to do something about. Uh, but I worked for the Chancellor of the Exchequer very happy arrangement <laughs> and I would need to have his approval and the Chancellor of the day was Mr. Harold Macmillan so I went and got his approval and thus the committee began and when I had uh, assembled the committee I then broke the news to the Treasurer and he said, oh, well, old man, I know you're very interested in this kind of thing. I said, I certainly am. Uh, I said, of course, I warn you, this will cost money. And he said, yes, I had an idea that it would. And I said that any committee of competence that goes into the position of the universities, tremendously pressed as they were at that time by a vast flood of increase in those requiring university training, I knew that the cost uh, would be high. 
Up to that time, the Commonwealth Government had got along very quietly with a few special grants of a limited kind. I think we ran up to about a million and a quarter in the course of a year. But this one was bound to be in far greater figures than that. And I must say from my then colleague that he, he took this very well. And the committee got to work. And it produced its first report, its first triennial recommendation. And it was very large, as it seemed at that time. And once more I adopted what you might please, be pleased to describe as rather devious methods. I knew that if this report were distributed to the ministers too far ahead of a cabinet meeting, too many of them might get to know too much about it. And so I had it circulated one day and dealt with the next. <laughs> and we came out at the end of the day in cabinet with a complete approval of all the recommendations that had been made. And since then, of course, you know the story. I know some of it. I know that for the first uh, triennium under the auspices of the university's commission, what had seemed large figures in the Murray report turned out to be quite insignificant. And uh, Sir Leslie Martin uh, has developed nowadays almost the habit of avoiding my eye uh, because he knows and I know that the next triennium will be such as to leave the second one looking like a poor relation. Well, this is all good. It may be difficult, it is difficult, but it's incredibly good. And I'm happy to think that what has happened in the universities of Australia has been, in a sense, revolutionary. Never sufficient. The day will never come when university authorities will say, we are content with what they have, it can't come. This is not a static community. It's not a static world that we live in. Its problems are increasing, and the demand for people with cultivated intelligences is a, de is a growing demand, not only here, but all over the world. And consequently, I'm not here to say, well, uh, gentlemen, call it a day, would you? It's becoming a little uncomfortable. I'm quite prepared to say to you that I will wonder what's happened to the universities if they ever reach that comfortable position. This is a great task, and a task which any man claiming any elements of statesmanship at all ought to be delighted to participate in. Of course, sir, uh, it's always worth remembering, and I'm sure that you all remember it, that while there are great financial problems, great problems of building, great problems of securing equipment and of keeping abreast of the developing equipment, particularly in the scientific faculties, although all those present problems, one of the great problems will be to maintain in a growing university field the high quality of university staffs. This is a problem which occasions me, although I, I'm not responsible for dealing with it very much, but this occasions me more thought than all these other physical problems uh, to which I've referred because we must maintain the high standards. If there's one thing we can't afford in this country, it is to lower the standards of university training and to have first-class people, first-class men, first-class women in the various faculties is not going to be easy. Nor indeed, sir, can we contemplate that we're going to secure much help on that front from outside Australia. 
because all countries feel the same pressure, the same urge, the same urgent demand to maintain standards and to keep up and expand their first-class teaching population. Now, this is something that uh, I think uh, must inspire everybody to greater and greater efforts. And so, particularly here, what a marvellous thing it is. As I said to the Vice-Chancellor after lunch, what a marvellous thing it is to have the honour of presiding over and contributing to the growth of a new university. Something straight from the grassroots. Not just inheriting somebody else's work, but creating something on the spot. This is tremendous. You know, quite recently I, in America, I, I delivered uh, the Jefferson oration, as they're pleased to call it, at uh, Monticello. I suppose most of you remember that when Jefferson drafted his own epitaph for his own memorial stone, he wrote out Thomas Jefferson and his dates, draftsman of the Declaration of Independence, creator of the Virginia Statute for Religious Toleration, founder of the University of Virginia. Not a word about having been an ambassador, not a word about having been Secretary of State in George Washington's administration, not a word about having been Vice President, not a word about having been President for two terms of the United States of America, just these three simple things. And when he was asked by one of his relatives, why didn't you include these great matters? He said, well, I wanted to have put on my memorial what I had done for the people, not what the people had done for me. Now this, this is superb. It's so simple and yet it's full of that imaginative quality which is required in the creation of anything. And here with this new university, what a task, what an opportunity for many among you to be able to look back and say, well, I was one of the creators in the true sense of the university, the Monash University. Now, so I just want to say a word, if I may, about that very great man after whom this university is named. He was never involved in politics and therefore perhaps he escaped the barbed tongues of undergraduates. I'm perfectly certain that nobody would ever have dreamed of referring to a building with which Sir John Monash was associated as Jack's Shack. <laughs> but I'm told that already the ungodly in this university are referring to this as Ming's Wing. <laughs> but uh, the naming of this university, this was a positive inspiration. One of the greatest of Australians of all time, wonderful engineer, a famous and tremendous soldier, a scholar in his own right, a great expert in many fields of life, and an advocate, not only an advocate of good causes, but stopping at the word advocate, one of the greatest advocates I ever listened to in my life. A man who understood the art of persuasive speech, the art of clear speech, who used no jargon, but who went clear to the point, persuasively to the point, with effects that I had the opportunity of witnessing in the course of my own political life more than once. 
And so because the university is named after these great and famous men, I feel that a very great honor, even indifferently earned, has been conferred upon me to have my name associated with one school of study in the university named after him. It will always be a source of immense pleasure and pride to me, and to my family, and to my descendants. Now, so before I conclude, I would like to make one small contribution on the subject of the humanities. In this century, and particularly perhaps in the last 20 years of it, there has been a very great, inevitable and proper concentration of mind on what I will call, in the natural sense, scientific studies. Not only uh, for prestige purposes and for doing some uh, violence to the moon or something of that kind, no. But because this world, with its explosion of population, with the urgent demand that exists all over the world to increase the use of resources, the discovery of resources, the scientific application of resources in order to meet a growing population has become a task of tremendous urgency and of very great international significance. And therefore, it's, uh, it's right that there should be this attention. But it's wrong to think, as some people do, that studies which are not related to practical results of that kind are idle and useless. This century hasn't failed, either in science or in technology. It's produced almost the golden age of science and technology. But in terms of civilization, it has had failure after failure written up against it. And that's because we have become too fond of the idea that we're clever people, that we're very, very smart to be able to understand all these forces of nature and to harness them, to deal with them. Whereas the truth, of course, is that civilization, I repeat something I've said before many times, civilization is in the heart and mind of people. And the task of the humanist, the task of the people who teach and learn in a school of humanities is not to forget that history, for example, is no useless study, since a man who is ignorant of it will have no sense of proportion, no benefit of experience in dealing with new problems as they arise. Languages, and I throw in a, a with a dying inflection, a, a word for classics, languages, because a precise understanding of words and a dislike of jargon will save this world from many confusions and as many hostilities have arisen in the world and in society through misunderstanding as through gross differences of points of view. Philosophy, how important that we should have physics and go beyond it to metaphysics, that we should understand something about the source and nature of ideas, so that the man who passes through and is even lightly touched by these things is forever thereafter a, a, a wiser man, a better informed man, a better balanced man. And of course, so far as literature is concerned, I don't understand people who regard uh, 
the reading of great masters of prose or of poetry as a, an irrelevant occupation, exhibiting a slight but perceptible eccentricity. If I could compel every man sitting in all the parliaments of Australia to read something of this kind every night on going back from Parliament House, the standard of debate would rise in the most magnificent fashion. <laughs> Sir, I, I, I say no more about that. I, I merely reiterate that what we want in the world is undoubtedly great physicists and great chemists and great engineers and what have you, because the world is crying aloud for their work for the sake of its own problems and its own human beings all over the world. But it needs even more that wisdom, human understanding, which produces what I will call an educated tolerance of ideas. It needs these things far more. Because wars, disasters of that kind, bestial repressions here and there, the kind of thing we've become accustomed to reading about almost every day in the newspapers. These things don't arise from mechanical causes. They don't arise because there's some jealousy between one scientist and another. On the contrary, science tends more and more to be international in its quality and in its thought. These things arise from the fact that men have inadequately learned to understand men, and to have men understand them. Because there is not this quiet, passionless humanity sufficiently distributed around the world to make the very thought of some of these events that I've mentioned possible. Sir, I repeat, you've done me a very great honor I shall remember this occasion, but I shall remember even more the fact that in this new university, being pursued as it is with such vigor, such imagination, having as it most certainly has a great future, you should have thought fit to associate my name with a great section of that university is, I think, the greatest honor that any university could pay to any man. So I give it my blessing, and I once more declare it open. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now call upon the Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Matheson. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Prime Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It falls to me now, in a few words, to thank all those who have participated in the construction and conception of this building and in the ceremony in which we are taking part this afternoon. Our relations with uh, those who help us by designing the buildings are often marked by differences of view, um, which um, sometimes go almost as far as acrimony. But in the design of this particular building, uh, we have had the happiest relations with our architects, and in particular with Mr. Rob MacDonald, to whom I would like to pay a great tribute uh, for the work that he has done for us. 
This afternoon, uh, you are sitting here in circumstances that I hope are reasonably comfortable, but which have involved a lot of people in a lot of planning and a lot of work in turning a basement into something that approaches an assembly hall. And I think, I think the thanks of us all are due to them. I would like, too, to thank the chancellors of our sister universities who have come to help us celebrate this great occasion. And I would like to thank you who have come along uh, as members of the audience to be with us, too. Mr. Prime Minister, during the last two months or so, I have had the privilege and, and very great interest of visiting universities in half a dozen countries and in meeting and talking to the vice-chancellors of universities from a much larger number of countries. All of these universities, each in their own way, is faced with the problem to which you have referred, the problem of the explosion of university populations. At one end of the scale, in the developing countries, perhaps especially in Africa, <coughs> the great problem is to produce as rapidly as may be large numbers of educated people who can run these countries who are facing the problems of government uh, as independent countries uh, in a, an increasingly competitive world. Not only do the developing countries need trained doctors, lawyers, engineers, but they need men with ideas and with values that, that will en enable them to work not only wisely, not only efficiently, but wisely. But right at the other end of the scale, in the United States, where already a much larger proportion of the population is able to have access to universities than perhaps anywhere else in the world. Even there, there is a great surge of development uh, all across the country. On one side, in California, the great University of California is at the present time uh, building three new campuses, each to contain 20,000 students. And this is repeated uh, on the, uh, at one place or another right across the United States. In England, I thought they were in trouble. They were in trouble, sir, over the problem to which you have referred, the problem of quality and quantity. Not long after the war, it was the... It, it, was the it became the declared policy of the government of the day that no qualified student should be debarred by financial disability from attending a university. And the effect was given to this policy by making available scholarships and grants on a scale never be seen before in England, which enabled very large numbers of young people to aspire to a university education who in former generations would not have been able to do so. Academic thinking was, I believe for the most part, concentrated on the quality of the courses that would be offered by universities to these large and increasing numbers of students. And so the new universities that are growing up in England are for the most part small, they're nearly all fully residential or intended to be. Each of them is endeavoring to produce courses that are distinctive in character and challenging to students and to staff alike. But there has, I believe, in England been a defect in the political thinking that should have accompanied that academic thinking. Because the quantity of universities and university places that are being provided will, I'm afraid, prove to be sadly lacking. No less than half the students who uh, expect to be seeking admission to the universities in England next year will not find room for them. Australia, in some ways, I suppose, stands uh, between the United Kingdom 
and the United States. Looking perhaps to both these countries for guidance and, and uh, inspiration. Certainly, I believe in this country, the great majority of the population and indeed of the government believe that the universities should be open to all of those who can profit by coming to attend them. The word quota has become something of a hated word. Here, of course, we face all the problems of expansion that are to be found, whether in Africa or in the United States. Problems of university organization, of the nature of our courses, of where, do we, where we are to find the staff uh, to man the universities, and also problems of the relations between the universities and the governments who provide the finance. Perhaps we face these problems more acutely here than some other countries because of the rapid rise of the Australian population, especially uh, which makes the, the numbers of young people especially large in proportion. And of course, we are, our staffs have to be drawn from generations that were smaller in number. Nevertheless, we have some grounds for satisfaction uh, in the progress that has been achieved here, but not, I think, for complacency. I was interested to find that uh, in England, the pace at which it has been possible to get Monash going and into, into production, so to speak, was regarded as being quite beyond the capacity of England at the present time. I found this difficult to understand, but uh, one explanation, or one part of the explanation at any rate, is that the efforts of this state have been concentrated on one focal point, and with the, the whole of the resources of the state backed by the Commonwealth, it has been possible to make a, a good deal of progress in what is still quite a short number of years. We could, of course, have gone a little faster, uh, with a little more funds at the right time, but uh, even so, you may not all know that in three years we have uh, reached a student population of no less than 1,600. You know, one thing that I want to say that is perhaps not sufficiently realized is that universities are a bit like farms in this respect. Indeed, all, all educational organizations have this characteristic that you have to plant the seed at the right time if you're going to get a harvest. We operate, perhaps we shouldn't, but in fact we do, we operate on quite a rigid time scale. And in order to be ready for one academic year, it is necessary to make appropriate preparations sufficiently far ahead. We haven't always been able to do so. But the more precisely we are able to plant the seed to get our buildings ready to recruit our staff at the right time the more effectively shall we be able to fulfill the task to which we have set our hands this task is we are very conscious to play our part in making it possible for increasing numbers of students in this state to, or potential students in this state to have a university uh, education. But in this preoccupation or emphasis on quality, on quantity, we must not lose sight of the importance of the quality of what we offer to the students who come here, lest they find in our universities not the gold that they were hoping to find, but tinsel. This country, I believe, is particularly fortunate in the number of people in high places who realize the importance of quality and how it transcends the ever-present problem of quantity. In particular, our Prime Minister by the, his acceptance of the Murray Report, to which the Chancellor has referred, has made possible a very great expansion of the quantity of university education, so to speak, that is available. 
But in many public speeches, and especially in what he has had to say to us this afternoon, he has emphasized the importance of what we actually do with the students when we get here. This afternoon, sir, we have all listened with the very greatest uh, inspiration to what you've been saying to us. And I would like to thank you on behalf of the university for many things, not only for what you have done in, in Australia as a whole, not only for your work in helping this university to get going, but finally for giving time to come here and speaking to us and opening this building. Sir, we thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal proceedings for this afternoon. The university hopes, however, that you will stay on to inspect its building, which has just been opened, and to stay for afternoon tea. I now ask you to rise while the academic procession retires.